I want to welcome everyone here this morning. It's a, it's a rainy fall day. It looks like we're going to get the fall started here. Uh, this is the Morgantown Area Chamber of Commerce event. We've uh, started new events this election year. It's uh, exciting to, for our federal candidates to have an opportunity to have breakfast with, with the candidates. Uh, this morning we have great first congressional uh, district candidate, uh, Kendra Verche. I got that right. You did. Excellent. Uh, we're very happy to have her with us here this morning, breakfast with the chamber. We're, we call what I like to call a new conversation with the candidate where she can tell uh, us a little bit about ourselves, but more importantly, where we can actually have a conversation about issues that are important to our chamber members. As uh, we all know, we recently had a member survey about issues that are very important to our membership. Uh, those issues have been shared with Kendra. Uh, she will be talking about those issues and also issues that are important to the state as a whole, as well as our district. Uh, I. I uh, will be introducing here, she will be leading the discussion, my uh, co-chair of uh, the Government Affairs Committee, Libby Durr and Dan Miller. The, um, this uh, event will be taped by West TV. I appreciate their efforts. They post these uh, videos and the videos appear on uh, our website and they go, the videos are in the public domain for use both by the candidates uh, as well as our membership. So without further ado, I will turn this over to Dan and Libby. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for coming. Kendra, thanks for coming as well. My pleasure. Um, as Eldon mentioned, the uh, survey that we took for all of the various members of the chamber, we had more than a hundred comments which is encouraging because that indicates there's interest and we're getting um, enough feedback to give some validity to what we consider to be the important issues that we're facing this election year and to, to no surprise um, we found that there was a couple of uh, very high priority issues and um, maybe Libby if you'd want to um, we, we took that, that and then kind of massaged it into a question that would address the most important issues. And uh, Libby can ask you the first question that was basically devised from the response of the various members of the chamber. Okay. So, okay. so the first question. Oh, let me just, okay. what, what we should do is give you a little bit of time <laughs> is to tell us why you're motivated to run, uh, who you are, what your background is, and then we'll get into the questions. Okay. <laughs> Sounds good. good. Um, I'm a law professor, so I stand when I speak, if that's okay. Good, Please, um, good morning. My name is Kendra Frische, and I am the Democratic nominee for Congress in the West Virginia 1st District. Um, it gives me a real thrill to be able to say those words to you. I wouldn't have imagined 18 months ago that I would ever be saying the words that I am the Democratic nominee for Congress. Um, because it didn't occur to me that I would ever run for office. My job 18 months ago was what I still do, um, which is I'm a law professor at WVU. I teach mostly family law courses and civil procedure and professional responsibility. I'm a mom of two kids here in public schools. Uh, my son goes to Suncrest Middle School. My daughter goes to North Elementary. Um, I am someone who needs my job. I can't quit to run for office. I am busy, right? And there's not a mom, working mom today who would tell you that they don't feel like they're completely overwhelmed with everything that they need to do. Um, and so running for Congress was not something that I ever imagined that I could or would do. But in November of 2016, I think we saw something we have never seen before in our political uh, landscape, at least certainly not in my lifetime. Uh, what I think we saw was a real um, sort of anxiety and uh, frustration with the status quo. I think people are very, very tired of where our politics has taken us, and people want change. 
and I started talking to people about that. And I said, you know, I think we need people who are, you need to get back to our citizen representative government. We need people representing us who are working family, you know, part of working families, who are not independently wealthy, who are not retired. Uh, we need more working moms. We need people who's, who interact with the public schools because their kids are there. Um, and when I would have these conversations with people, they kept saying to me, well, then you need to run. And, you know, that was not my intent at all. But I realized after having many of these conversations, at some point you kind of think, well, if not me, who? How can I ask someone else to consider doing this if I'm unwilling to do it myself? And if not now, when? So I've never run for office before, as you can glean from what I'm saying. But I decided um, to really explore the possibility. And I kept having this conversation with my husband um, over and over again. Can I do this? Is this something that would be smart for our family? I think it's going to be hard on the kids. I think it's going to put a lot of pressure on work. You know, We're just going to have all of these additional responsibilities that are going to consume us in addition to what we already have um, in terms of our responsibilities. And after my poor, long-suffering husband heard that conversation, multiple times, he finally said, time out. Do you mean to tell me that you think it's a bad thing for our children to see their mother run for Congress? And he framed the question in a way that it flipped my analysis and made me realize what he was saying, which he followed up with, was this is something you need to do for our children. This is something you need to do for our family, for our community, and for our state. People need to see you do this. People see, need to see you take that kind of leadership role. Uh, I wasn't quite, I mean, he got me along the way. I mean, I was pretty close to making a decision at that point to run, but I didn't make the final decision at that point. When I finally decided, about a week, it was about a week later, I was mowing the lawn in my backyard like this, it's West Virginia, uh, and it was, it was hot and I was sweating and I was really feeling sorry for myself you know I've got all these responsibilities and here I've got to do this too and I gotta get the kids from camp and whatever it was in the middle of summer and um, and and I thought how can I possibly add something as monstrous to my to this responsibility of my life already as running for Congress and there was this light bulb that went off and I thought you know what moms do hard things and if none of the moms step up and do this we'll never see a government that's representative of our community. So in that moment, I decided I would run. So September 21st, 2017, I declared. Uh, every newspaper article about me said, good candidate, great message, she can't win. <clears throat> can't happen. She doesn't have enough money. And it's true, I didn't have a lot of money at all. Um, I actually raised about $65,000 in the primary, which was a tenth of what my main opponent, Ralph Baxter, raised, $650,000. He outraised me 10 to 1, he outspent me 6 to 1, and I won by 9 points. That's indicative of something bigger than me. I don't think that's just about me and my message and what people um, you know, hear from me. I think that is, there's a groundswell of people looking for representative citizen uh, you know, legislators who are more reflective of our communities. So um, about 36 hours after I won the primary, the newspaper articles were good candidate, good message, impressive win. She can't win. She doesn't have enough money. Um, we're going to prove them wrong again. My intent is to win this seat. I have not been shy or, um, uh, you know, I haven't hidden my, uh, my intent to win it regardless of the money differential. I think that we have what we're seeing now in, in politics is no longer conventional and our conventional wisdom is, is turned around. So um, the, the, the measures that we typically use to, to judge the success of a candidate, I think, are no longer the right measures. So what I've been doing is running a grassroots campaign. I'm out in the communities, I'm driving around north central West Virginia. I've got 30,000 miles on my car for this race. And that's after work. That's on the weekends. That's sometimes I can push, cram it together with a cross-country meet for my son. Uh, but we, you know, we just have been working incredibly hard and going door to door and calling people and getting our message out in the most efficient, inexpensive way we can. And it's working because people are paying attention. 
So um, I'll just sum up, because I'm going to answer questions, I'll just sum up basically my platform. What I uh, decided at the beginning of this campaign is that people, what I was hearing from people, needed to be reflected. Uh, that's, the, that's service that needs to, you know, our elected leaders need to, um, need to engage in with the electorate. So I listened to what people wanted, and what people want is they want to be able to stay in West Virginia. They want to be able to stay in this place that we all love. And people f right now feel like they can't. So I put on my website when I launched, I want to fight for your freedom to stay in West Virginia. Because too many people aren't able to engage in the economy here in a way that allows them to choose to be here. People are dying of drug addiction. We're losing population at record rates. And we're about to lose a congressional seat in 2020 in the census. That is not the West Virginia that we all know and love. And that's not a supported West Virginia. So I think we need a change in leadership. And this is about freedom. We're getting away from our freedom when people aren't able to go to the doctor because they don't have enough money. We aren't living free if kids aren't supported in schools because the re schools don't have the resources to, to teach those kids. And we're not living free if the communities are literally crumbling, which is what we see, not, not so much here in Morgantown, but outside of Morgantown, I can tell you I've seen it over and over again in this part of the, uh, of the state and, and the entire state for that matter. So I, that's my broad platform, and I will be happy to get into more specifics. But I'll just wrap up by saying I'm Kendra Frechet, and I'm the Democratic nominee for Congress in the West Virginia 1st District. Thank you. Thanks, Kendra. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. OK. The um, Government Affairs Committee got together and selected topics and issues that they thought people perceived as, as issues in our area, specifically the Montana area. Mm -hmm. um, and then the chamber as a whole ranked those. So, not surprisingly, <laughs> the number one ranked issue was roads, roads and transportation. transportation. Yeah. Yes. So, we've broken that down into two questions. The first question is, and again, it's specific more to our area, is what actions will you take to ensure the state funding for new roads, if there is state funding for new roads spent in Long County? Mm -hmm. Well, um, so people often wonder how the federal government plays into these, um, to these considerations. And the federal government really, the main, the main uh, sort of function of the federal government with respect to how states are supported is resource infusion. So we need the federal government. Here's my take, uh, my overall take on how the federal government should be interacting with West Virginia when it comes to funding. Um, which directly links into roads and transportation. We are 50th on almost every measure that you want to be first on. And we're first on almost every measure you want to be 50th on. I think of this and the way that our elected officials should be advocating for West Virginia and therefore North Central West Virginia and therefore Mon County is that we should be able to make the pitch that when you're the last on the list, you get to be first priority for the football fans in the room, right? How the NFL arranges the draft. The last, in the, the season before, is the first pick in the draft, which uh, it's gotten me in a little bit of trouble because then everybody says you're comparing us to the Cleveland Browns, which is not my intent, but that's just the reality right now, although they're doing pretty okay this year. Um, so the, the thing that we need to do is have elected officials who can go to Congress and say, we have a legitimate claim on being top priority for the entire country right now. And we've had that legitimate claim for decades. And it's getting worse. So resource infusion. And I think the pitch for Mon County in particular is Mon County bears a huge brunt of the, um, of the, of the you know, road and transportation needs because we have so many people coming into the county for you know, football games, for we, we have a, an infrastructure strain here that is significant, as do the counties where there's, say, for example, natural gas extraction. Uh, Doddridge County is a good example. And I can attest to the road quality, right? I've driven on all of them for the last year. Um, and so what I'll say to that, too, is there's an intangible piece of those road, the road quality, that the difference between driving on the roads when they were literally, you had to be you know, it was like white knuckling it to make sure that you didn't rip out the suspension on your car by hitting a giant pothole. 
to the roads that have been repaired, that are smooth, and you're driving and you actually appreciate the view. You can appreciate West Virginia for the beautiful place that she is all of a sudden because of the quality of the roads. Um, so my job is to make sure that the resources come into the state. The legislature's job is to make sure that those resources come to Mon County in particular. Um, and we see that some of the roads are improving here and it's making a big difference already. I think we can all attest to that. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, the first question was really about the new roads, and so the second question is very similar. What actions will you take to ensure the state funding for maintenance of roads is spent? Maintenance of roads is spent in Montgomery. Yeah, um, this and this is the tough part, right? And this is the hard part of legislating um, generally. How do you pitch that you are more important than the others in the same boat, right? Everybody, and I'll tell you, throughout the throughout the first district, there are legitimate concerns that Mon County takes more than it should, right? People are like, well, my roads are not even fixed in the first place. Why are we advocating for maintenance in Mon County? But it comes down to, I think we need clear data to show the reality of, how, of the usage of the roads. And that will translate, I think, more directly into fair application of the funds. So, the, and that goes for both fixing the roads and maintaining. Because if we fix the roads and we don't maintain them, we're back in the same very expensive spot of having to fix them all over again instead of just having quality roads in the, in the first place. But you know, you go over to Westover, you've got slips that are taking out roads for months at a time. Um, we have significant problems and needs here in Mon County that still need to be addressed. So uh, it's, it's a resource allocation and it's being able to make the pitch on the basis of data that we have more of a need or at least a significant enough need that that funding should land here. Very good. The uh, second priority, kids home close to your employer, has to do with higher education. Mm -hmm. And uh, the question we came up with was, what actions will you take to improve and preserve funding for higher education at, in West Virginia? Well, one of the challenges that WVU has seen in any state-funded institution in West Virginia is um, the continual uh, chipping away of funding from the state. You know, we have a land-grant institution that we're all very proud of, that is the, no, the number one economic driver, certainly in this part of the state, um, and in fact, probably in most of the state. And students used to have promise scholarships that were fully funded so they could come here. The funding was a much higher rate for WVU, and now it's down below 15% in state funding. Um, that is, I mean, if you just look at what's happening in Mon County and how healthy we are as compared, particularly in Morgantown and our economy, that economic driver, as compared, right, it's not perfect, but as compared to other parts of the state, Mon County and Morgantown in particular are better economically, more economically stable than a lot of parts of the state. And that's because of WVU, which is also why we have businesses that are dependent and can, can grow. Small businesses can grow as a, as a result of WVU being healthy and funded. And I, you know, we have our two main economic drivers in Mon County are state funded, WVU and the school system. They're the hubs of this community. I mean, we have certainly private businesses that are in, important to the economy here, inc incredibly important. But those state-funded institutions are the reason that a lot of businesses are here. And so I think from the pr perspective of the chamber, you can make an argument to the state that this is a win-win, right? The state, su the state supports our main economic driver in the, in the region, and that supports business and makes sure that this model for the rest of the state, for our strong, healthy economy, can be replicated elsewhere Maybe not obviously with anything like a WVU, but we can show what we do well when it comes to business development and hopefully expand that throughout the state. And certainly the first district in my, my priority list. Good. Um, the fourth question is, and it deals with tourism and in the end jobs, what can you commit to do to help pass Bill 4431, which is legislation that would let the ground rules for the creation and supervision of the Mountaineer Trail Network, which is locally in this county. Yeah. 
So, um, you know, that's obviously state, right? That's a state, state um, issue. Um, but one of the things that I feel really strongly about in my platform of the freedom to stay in West Virginia is that requires a diversified economy. It requires focusing on things that bring people in for other reasons than the same ones that we've been doing for centuries. We have got to be more diverse in how we think about drawing people to West Virginia. And one of the ways that we do that is through tourism. And, um, and that means that we need to make sure that the beauty of our state is preserved and that is something that the federal government can do. We can make sure that the clean water and clean air um, is, is, is protected here or that we have it if we don't. That we make sure that our resources are protected so that people can come and see the beauty that we all know and appreciate and love about West Virginia. Um, I, I was surprised actually when I looked at the summary that tourism um, is lower on the priority list in the, it, for, for you all. Because, and I wondered actually, I was thinking I would ask if, if anybody has any insight on why that might be. Um, because it may be that we here in this like little kind of microcosm that we live in, see that, you know, we have tourism. We're, we know what it's like to have tens of thousands of people come in on a weekend to Morgantown. So we might feel like we're good when it comes to tourism. But that's something that could really benefit the uh, many parts of West Virginia that we're not currently seeing. People get in their airplanes and fly over West Virginia to go to Colorado all the time. We live within 80% of the population of the country. Uh, we live within six hours driving. We could be that place. There's no reason why we can't be that place where people say, I'm going to West Virginia for the weekend, going to this little community that I love. We're going to go hiking. We're going to go mountain biking. We're going to go river rafting. But we can't encourage people to do that if we aren't developing things that draw in that tourist uh, base. Very good. Final question is somewhat of an open-ended one, and that is if you feel passionate about a particular area that we didn't discuss in the four questions, mm -hmm. uh, let us know what your passions are, and then we'll open it up for the audience. One of the things that I think is most significantly impacting business in West Virginia is the drug addiction crisis. People can't, businesses can't find people to work because they are addicted to drugs and they are not able to engage in the workforce um, and, and, and help grow the community and engage in the community to help keep it stable. That's hugely problematic for business. And so I see that actually as a healthcare crisis. I also see healthcare as a real problem for business because business owners bear the burden of healthcare in our country. It's very expensive. I, made a, I had a visit with a small business in Parkersburg um, a, a gentleman who owns a very highly specialized thread company that actually ships throughout the world, particularly to Russia and Ukraine. Um, and they actually made the thread that made the, the, um, the uh, epaulets on um, the Game of Thrones main character. She had the very significant dress that was really um, well known. The thread on that, on those, on those shoulders of her dress came from Parkersburg, West Virginia. Um, I did a tour of his factory. He does provide health insurance for his employees and it's the single largest expense that he has outside of salaries. He wants universal health care because his small business would benefit from it. He wouldn't then be responsible for the health care of his employees. He would be able to pay them better because he wouldn't be carrying that burden alone. So the burden that's borne by small businesses who choose to engage in, um, in providing health care to, to their employees is a heavy burden that should be shared by a society because, if, because we all need health care. And we know when you're unhealthy and you can't work because you're unhealthy, you now are in the cycle of being a burden on, you know, you go to the emergency room for your health care because you can't afford the preventive care, which is very expensive. Um, and we pay for that, right, through our taxes. We're already paying for it. So I think we need to share that burden through universal health care. How are we going to get there? I'm not going to lie and say I have a solution and I know how to fix it. That would be naive, at the, you know, putting it mildly. I don't see myself as a solution bringer. I see myself as a problem solver. And so I would like to go to Washington and work with people who identify this as a problem in their communities as well and work toward a solution to making sure that people have health care so they can be healthy, so they can work. 
because that's really the basis of our economy in West Virginia right now, it, which is is porous, right? And we've got some holes in that economic basis because of a health care crisis right now. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. So for the audience, um, when you have, if you have a question, please um, speak loudly because we don't have a microphone here. And then um, we'll let Kendra answer your questions. Uh, Susan, I know you're with the uh, tourism here and that fourth question was kind of in your area. I don't know if you have any particular. Yeah, I'm curious if what your take is on why it's not a higher priority for folks here. Well, I, I, honestly, I think that uh, tourism statewide needs two things in place. Infrastructure is huge. If you don't yeah. have a great place to go to, people aren't going to have a great experience. If they don't have a great experience, they're not coming back. And then trying to recuperate and do the damage control from bad PR, bad publicity yeah. is, is a challenge. We need good roads and we need statewide broadband. Yep. Those two things. Yep. We don't even have, we have holes in Mon County where broadband is a problem. Yep. Oh, so, believe me. Oh, I, I can tell. I can tell you how many times I'm, yep, no service. Yep. You know, just put so, the phone down. And, and there's a perception throughout the rest of the state that, you know, Morgantown's richest right. area in the state, you know, they're good to go. Mm -hmm. right. No, not really. You know, right. we have good roads and statewide broadband. Those two things have to be in place. Yep. Then from there, um, telling the message and putting the investment mm -hmm. into tourism as a whole, coordinating, it's a real challenge in West Virginia. Um, the Mountaineers will always be free and the independent <laughs> nature, which is wonderful, but right. great quality, but it really hasn't helped a, a lot of us um, play well together, particularly yeah. when it comes to promotion and messaging. We, you know, yeah. if you look at what the newspaper was this Sunday with an editorial on, you know, what do you have to be proud of? I mean, I have a penned response and I've been waiting to send it because yeah. I'm thinking it's not, I don't know that I'm working a name to it. But, um, <laughs> I have those moments. Yeah, it's very good to wait. I said to do the night over and sleep on it. But um, we have a tremendous amount of assets. We don't do a very good job of, we need to get out of our own way. Yeah. West Virginians are, are often our, our own um, greatest challenge yeah. because we don't strive for excellence. We're striving for maybe, mm -hmm. average maybe, because we're used to being 50th. Yeah. And I think there's excitement now, you know, and, and when it comes to messaging and really, really driving the area, and, and we don't look at our environment as the rich beauty and what we have in our asset base yeah. to, that, that I work with every day to message to others. Yeah. You know, the great outdoors, um, our attendees that come to Mont County for events, mostly WVU driven, yeah. but all kinds of events. Um, so what we have to do is we need to work together in yeah. order to message and get the biggest bang for those dollars, we need to do it regionally, and then we need to do it statewide. There's an exercise that we do. We say, everybody here, at the count of three, say the name of the, the street that you live on. One, two, three, and it would sound like, ooh, you know, right. town of Babel. If we all say one, two, three, and we all say the name of the state we live in, it's West Virginia, that message we can take across the country and get the, yep. the that six to 14 to one return on investment yep. that you get by putting those dollars out there and doing good, hot, realistic. Don't we, yep. can't, we can't set ourselves yep. up for failure. Realistic messaging, realistic promotion, and real, realistic coordinated effort. And and this this is the best job in the whole wide world that I have. Yeah. I'm to do. Yeah. So I think that if we could get people to understand the value of what tourism, we have over 2,200 jobs that we represent. I have all kinds of statistics. I'll bet. <laughs> um, but, you know, just in Mont and Preston County alone. Yeah. And it's, a, it's a very, very, very big business. Opioid is a real challenge yeah. for our industry um, because of the workforce. Yep. Oh, no, I mean, so all of it overlaps, right? These are all overlapping issues. I will tell you, I think most people know I wasn't born in West Virginia. I came here for WVU. My husband came here for WVU. He's also a law professor at WVU. Um, but we, so when we were interviewing, for our jobs here, people would say, why are you going to West Virginia? Why are you thinking about, they say terrible things about West Virginia, outside of West Virginia. I'm not telling you anything you don't already know. Um, and I would say, are you kidding me? Have you been there? I mean, the second you cross into the state, it's like, what, is, what have we been hearing? The reputation outside of the state is so bad and it's so wrong. And I actually think that creates an opportunity because right now, 
the thing that's interesting, particularly, particularly to young people, is that place that needs you, right? The underdog. We're about the underdog right now, we lo and, and we're about culture. West Virginia has music and food and beauty and people that, like no other place in the country, and I'm not just saying that because I'm running for office. I truly believe that, and I have since the second I crossed the border. Um, the other thing I'll say is that um, we have, we ha uh, we're 50th on so many measures. One of the things that we are first on, that we want to be first on, we are the most neighborly state in the country. We are number one on neighborliness. That's because West Virginians are kind, and they're thoughtful, and they want to take care of each other. Nobody knows that outside of West Virginia. We know it because we live here, we see it. But the one exception that proves the rule on that 50th on every measure is that we are the most neighborly state in the country. And that says something about us, but people don't know it outside of here. I think for a really long time, the infrastructure and needs of, and, and the desire to take care of one another, as yep. stated, has, has caused tourism investment yep. and promotion to be last on the list. Yep. But um, there's all kinds of studies out there, the Pure Michigan campaign, what the state of Colorado went through to finally, in this last, um, in this, uh, I guess last year was really the first year that they really put some respectable, not anywhere what we need, but respectable investment into the promotion. And we're seeing tremendous results. We're up double digits across the board Good. and have been for the last two years. Yeah. Yep. Um, but we're hoping that that doesn't turn into a target. It's like, oh, look, they have all this money. Let's put it into this, this, and this. Right, so, right. Um, we need to keep doing that messaging. Um, yeah. so. It's a matter of political priority, right? It's a matter of political priority. And you, but you've got to have the dominoes in the right order. We can make a big priority out of promoting uh, travel, and people can't liter literally can't get to the place that they want to go to because their car would fall into the pothole. Uh, you know, anybody been to Blue Hole? Uh, it, yeah, if you want to get out there, it's, it's awesome. I went out, I met Mother's Day privilege a few years ago. I said, we're going to Blue Hole. And uh, we went, and it was amazing. Um, I, we accidentally crashed some law students' fun while they were out there. I swam out to a big rock, and I was like, hey. And they were like, hi, professor. I was like, I'll go back. I'm sorry. I didn't realize, you know, this was, it was awkward. They were like, do you want a beer? I was like, oh, you guys have fun. I'm going to go. But we, we blew out a tire. Uh, that, was, that was the rest of Mother's Day. So, you know, you can't even get to the places you want to get that are amazing. Um, so, what other questions? Yes, Colleen. Actually, from tourism, I'm bringing actually women from six different states to Canadian Valley next weekend for a hiking and yoga retreat. Awesome. So, people do want to come here for sure. I saw some advertising for that because Tucker County's in the district. I was down there. I'm, I'm going back on Saturday. Yeah, so. Yeah. so, so that's grand. Um, opioid epidemic. Here. Yep. Um, I've been this profession. I've seen not only that, but even before the opioid epidemic, all of the other lifestyle related things are just killing our state. And in 2012, the Bipartisan Policy Commission did a report and they looked at what makes us healthy and where we spend our values. 50% of what makes us healthy is our lifestyle, 20% is our environment, only 10% is access to health. Right. 's an experiment that I've seen done where uh, someone actually came to he he was talking about environmental change and um, scientific data about harms to our environment and he was talking he said um, if you had a choice 
between, say, you live in a, an economy or a world, a, a place where you have the best, high, best state of the art, most um, you know, incredible healthcare system that you can have. You, you know, the best equipment, the best treatments, everything you can have to treat cancer and, and uh, diabetes and all of the things that uh, plague us. But you don't have clean air, water, or food. Which do you choose? Everybody chooses clean air, water, and food, right? That's health. Health care is different than health. And keeping people healthy is a matter of community. It's not just so when I say everything that from the federal government that comes into West Virginia should, oh, you should always be able to justify as an elected official that that resource development is going to go to people and communities first. Because without people and communities, none of the rest can happen. And when we see community disengagement is when we see a drug addiction crisis that is killing us at a higher rate than any other state in the country. Um, so what I see is happening with the drug addiction crisis is twofold. One is the immediate need of people who are addicted, who need treatment. But the other, and that's exactly on the same plane, is rebuilding our communities because we can't get healthy with drug addiction or obesity or uh, diabetes or any of the, the chronic illnesses that have plagued us if our communities aren't healthy because you can't engage in, in nothing. You can't engage when something is crumbling. Um, and I think that's, the, that's really at the core of our, of our crisis. So I think it's development at the community level in terms of supporting small business. So the other problem that, I, that we're seeing is the businesses that are building in West Virginia, that are growing in West Virginia, that are strong in West Virginia are Dollar General and Walmart that pay very low wages, do not have health insurance for employees, and people can work in those in those businesses full time still and take on another job and still not have enough money to feed their family without SNAP. That's not health. That is not a healthy economy. It's not a healthy populace. And we, th those, these are overlapping problems that compound upon each other. So I think it's a community that we have to rebuild our communities by investing at the community level. I am not, I was not in favor of the tax cuts that were recently implemented because I think it puts too much money at the top and not enough money at the community level. I don't think we have the investment that we need from those in West Virginia from those tax cuts to really turn us around. So I think we need to be focusing on people, if we're going to do tax cuts, we want middle class tax cuts, I'm all for it. Let's actually do that because people need the infusion of cash so that they can support their communities and we can all come up. There's uh, another question that Dan can ask him better than I can, so I'm going to remind him about the question about the hub. You always ask the question about the hub. Oh, the underground storage hub? Yeah. Yeah, that is on a national level. We've got mm -hmm. such an opportunity to take advantage of basically creating a storage tank for energy so that the cracker plants mm -hmm. will have the security that they need in the event of bad weather or various right. other things. And that decision, that's a, that's a critical factor in them making the decision to locate in this area. Right. And we've had some uh, debate with the um, representatives in Texas because they have the storage hub down there, the only one we have in the country. And there's consideration on a federal level to put some money into developing the resource to create that. And if that is done, his long-term goal is going to be multiple cracker plants mm -hmm. and the estimate is close to 100,000 jobs that will right. follow. So one of the things that I think has, has been problematic for West Virginia since the extraction industry got started here by uh, mining salt hundreds of years ago is that those that what we extract from West Virginia goes right out. And we aren't getting every layer of the economic advantage from those natural resources that we have. Natural gas, we have more pressure of natural gas in Doddridge County in West Virginia than anywhere in the world. High quality natural gas. That natural gas is coming out of the ground. It's going to come out of the ground. We live in a capitalist market driven society. We are going to be extracting that gas. Whether we are going to get the advantage of it remains to be seen. 
right? The revenue advantage. Um, so what I propose is that we, first of all, treat it like it is the natural resource, the lucrative natural resource that it is, and tax the removal of it. We keep it here to the extent that we can get multiple layers of the economic advantage from it. Um, and I think that there is some value in exploring the hub, but we have to make sure that it's environmentally safe. That's the, and that's my other concern. So we have said you know, throughout the centuries, we're gonna be this place that fuels the rest of the country in building the United States. But we, what we have not demanded like Alaska did that that resource benefit us first. And we need to make that demand. And, and that demand includes making sure that the community is safe in the store where the storage is because we don't want to create a bigger problem by having what could be a very advan advantageous thing for the economy end up being a di natural disaster um, and killing our potential tourism. So I, I have said many times, um, anybody who tells you that you can't have a good job and a safe and flourishing eco you know, environment is lying. It's a, it's a matter of political priority. We can have both. There are places that have both. It's, it's not, you know, Colorado actually is a good comparator in some ways. There's extraction industry in Colorado. It's also thriving tourism. There are small businesses that, that have done extremely well. Uh, the economy is very strong. And that leads me into other economic development, which is in West Virginia, medical cannabis. We have a law that has made medical cannabis uh, available to people and, and we can't implement that law because the federal government is in the way. So this is where, I mean, I see where we, we say we're, you know, we want to be pro-business and we see our legislature and our Congress getting in the way of that. Um, that's not, uh, that doesn't make sense for West Virginia, but we have to have a balance. I am not going to tell you that we should just do that because it'll bring the jobs and continue on this path of tearing it up. And, and not having um, you know, a plan to make sure that we are protected in West Virginia. Yeah. I'm running for county commission, so yes. that. But to build upon what you just said, my concern, especially in this county, is the fact that our jobs are pretty much stagnant. What I, and right along with what you're saying, is to build on the hub portion, but what, what do you see as a federal role in producing the follow-on jobs that take the, the plastic manufacturers, everything that's gonna pull out of these, these crafted plants and everything. To me, that's the way, if you wanna build communities, if you wanna tackle the opioid, you've got to build the communities with jobs. People mm -hmm. who have a job, and are proud in their job, are mm -hmm. proud in their community, do not take drugs. I work in the right. aeromedical. Right. And to me, they're all inter commit intermingled. They are. And uh, so in order to do that, though, we have to get out here and have not a Walmart and not a cash register job. Mm -hmm. We have to have a guy out there working the line, yeah. like uh, coal mines, which are not coming back. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I think that we are, given the fact that West Virginia literally wrote most of the clean water and air because of our mining industry, and I grew up in the Orange Creek since then. Yep. We are not accepting a, a poor pollution policy. Right. So I think that that, I don't think we should ignore it, but I don't think it's gonna come. But, so I wanna see us build jobs in this, County, in this state, in this country, that keep the money here and don't mm -hmm. take it overseas and don't take it for us, Pennsylvania, whatever. I mean, I, I want to see us act regionally right here right. in Montgomery County. So what can you do as a federal government to yeah. try to push money towards development on the private side? I mean, I think government jobs are great, but in mm -hmm. the end, it's mm -hmm. the private sector that drives the train. Yeah. So. Well, no, no question. The private sector is what's paying into the revenue stream that we get, right? The, the private sector individuals pay the taxes. Um, and so what we need to do is focus on the vertical economy, right? So it's not just, because we're used to being at that foundational level and fueling everybody else's fu vertical economy. One example, the timber that goes out of West Virginia is shipped overseas and made into rocking chairs in China. They can be made into rocking chairs right here. And the way that we do that is we incentivize people who have that skill, which we have right here in West Virginia because we have artisans in West Virginia, just using one example. We incentivize them to start new businesses because their communities are healthy and supported. Uh, they have health care. They, um, 
you know, the, the, the tax breaks that we saw go to them and not some other corporation that might invest in West Virginia. It's, again, community infusion of resources. So, you know, the federal government needs to be the leader in fighting the opioid epidemic because it takes that level of resources to address the problem that we have. That's step one. The federal government is, is going to be the driver of resources into West Virginia to help bolster our infrastructure needs with broadband and roads and transportation. That helps businesses grow. But part of the problem is, and I'll, you know, I, I, have the, I think the legislature in West Virginia has been, uh, I don't think it's as pro-business as, it as it likes to say it is, because we keep trying to do the same thing over and over again. It's the definition of insanity. You do the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result. We need completely innovative ideas to reinvent our economy. And one of the things we can do, our flag has two on the, the seal of West Virginia. On one side is a miner, on the other side is a farmer. We are from, we have agricultural roots here in West Virginia that we have abandoned for the most part. But industrial hemp could be a very lucrative crop in West Virginia, and the, the state and the federal government are in the way. Um, we, you know, reclaiming strip, strip mine uh, land for lavender, which was an experiment that was tried recently and didn't go as well as hoped, but that doesn't me mean we don't try that again or other things that might actually take hold. Um, what we need to do is allow people to use the resources they have. A lot of people in West Virginia do own property, but they don't, but it's not worth anything to them because they can't sell it to someone. They don't want to sell it to someone. And we have a bunch of problems with our property law where nobody knows who owns what anymore, but that land can be worked. Our artisans can be supported. Our resources and infrastructure um, to the extent that the federal government can support what's happening in West Virginia and keep it in West Virginia is how we build that vertical economy that we've never really been able to take advantage of. So again, I don't have specific answers on exactly how the government can do that other than it's a priority for me and that's what I would advocate for as you know, sort of this problem solver as opposed to solution bringer. Yes. I have a bit of a comment slash question. So uh, I represent the Bridgeport Farmers Market and work for local food advocacy in West Virginia. And maybe backing a little bit on the tourism piece, because recently we held a, our annual fundraiser that we held every year in Lost Creek Farm. Mm -hmm. was the yep. Featured chef. Mike was and uh, uh, yeah, was Mike Costello. Yeah. For the first time ever since we posted these fundraisers, we have people coming in from Philadelphia, from DC, from Baltimore. And they came purely because they saw that episode and they said, We've never thought of West Virginia as a place to visit for tourism yeah. ever. And they were so inspired by the piece about Lost Creek Farm. Yep. And I've never seen that. You know, to this day, yeah. that to me was just this incredible glimmer of hope. It's such an opportunity yep. to build on the tourism I agree and actually so I, I couldn't agree more and this is the thing when I'm talking about the intangibles when you're driving on a road where you're not actually worried about your your you know axle getting torn out um, and you can look up and see the beauty of West Virginia I had this moment where you know I've been driving around the roads there was this road that had been re, uh, had been repaired in Preston County and I'm driving and I'm like wow Wow, it's the intangibles, the, the things that are hard to put your finger on. So a farmer's market that draws people in, that you have beautiful displays of locally grown food is something that makes people feel proud of their community and makes people want to come to that community. And um, Anthony Bourdain really did us an incredible favor at the end of his life by coming here. Um, I actually wish that the Lost Creek Farm, I, I know Mike and um, and I was really excited and we had um, another friend um, Jonathan Hall was a part of that episode and um, and we were really excited for that to come out and I was a little disappointed that they didn't spend more time on that segment of it because that's West Virginia too we see the other part of West Virginia that there's the stereotype of West Virginia it's a fetishization of West Virginia it's not necessarily at all accurate or depicts the diversity of our communities in every way um, and so that Lost Creek Farm feature in that episode was the West Virginia that so many of us see and so few 
realize is there, and if we build it, they will come. This is the thing. This is what people want now. I'm like, hey, we're the literally, you know, you think, look at what young people are doing in terms of they, how they engage in their communities now. They go to music festivals. We have more music festivals in West Virginia than most places. These little tucked away uh, festivals where people bring their tents and they hang out and listen to folk music and incredible, you know, this community um, experience. We've got incredible local foods. We've got things that are go back in our history with, um, with so many cultural influences, art and music, that's what brings people in. And, um, and I think that is our ace in the hole and our little secret weapon. Um, because people have an opinion about West Virginia and there's something really powerful about that opinion being turned, flipped, and saying, I used to think bad things about West Virginia and now I think it's incredible. And I'll give you one example that seems it's tangential, but it's true. Our teachers, right? The teacher strike that happened and not everybody was in agreement with that. I was, I was supportive of the teachers, but one of the things that it did was around the country, people see West Virginia teachers as a beacon of hope. And a student, I'll tell you uh, this little tidbit, a student of mine, a graduate of the law school, lives. several of our graduates live in Colorado. They move there because it reminds them of home, uh, and they don't feel like they can be here, so they go there. And one of our graduates was walking to work one morning while the um, teachers in Colorado were doing a little, um, event, you know, kind of ginning up support for teachers and they were holding their signs that said, don't make me go West Virginia on you, which we saw that all over the country. And they're holding their signs. So our graduate says, hey, teachers, good job. I'm from West Virginia. And they're like, what? I mean, it was like she, they stopped. And she said, well, yeah, I'm, I mean, I'm not a teacher. And they said, but you're from West Virginia. <laughs> and she said it was the most remarkable thing she'd ever seen being from West Virginia, where all of a sudden she was a rock star because she was from West Virginia. We, we, I mean, when, you're the, when you are the, the place where everybody thinks the most negative things, and you can turn that, that is a power that we've never seen turned on in West Virginia. And that's what I want to do for West Virginia, is be a cheerleader for this place in DC, because I don't see it happening right now. Yes? So you're skipping to the front of the line, and I think that is fantastic, and that you don't have any governmental policy political experience. Right. Going straight for the yep. Yep. What advantage do you feel that you have going in without any governmental experience? Yeah. So um, a couple of things. One, I, and this is just a skill set that I have, I am really good at bringing people to the table. I'm very good at finding common ground where it doesn't seem like there is any. Because I am very, I feel very strongly that every single person, even the most politically you know, different from me, there is something we can agree on. I know it. Something we can agree on. Everybody who's in Congress has that ability to make that bridge. Um, but the reason why I think I, in particular, have a leg up is because right now voters want people who don't have the baggage of the, of the anger that's going on in Congress right now. You know, I, I, one of the things I think is happening is that anxiety that we've all felt Everybody's feeling anxious. I don't care what your political background is. Everybody feels anxious about what's happening in the country over the last, you know, few years, right? More, more than just since 2016, which is where we saw it kind of crystallize in the election where people just acted out of anger and frustration and anxiety, whatever their, whatever their votes were. That anxiety is manifested in three ways. People do one of three things when they feel anxious. They, they get angry and they fight. They retreat and seek comfort and disengage and or they roll up their sleeves and they go to work. Right now I think what we're seeing fueled is a lot of anger. We're seeing divisiveness. We're seeing this really intense dislike of each other in Congress and it's not moving us forward. We're stuck in the mud. What we need are the doers. So look around your community. Who are the people who show up early? Who are the people who plan in advance? Who are the people that fold up the chairs after the event and wash the dishes? Those are the people we should be sending to Congress. It's not the people we usually think of as sending to Congress, but it's the people who actually do the work instead of people who are mired in this political. Look, I came from nowhere, right? People didn't know who I was. They didn't, you know, they, I wasn't plugged into any party structure. I really came out of the blue. And in fact, I think that's what voters wanted. 
I think it's an advantage. I don't take corporate PAC money. I want to be able to listen to you and only you and, and serve you. And I can't do that if most of my funding is coming from some corporation that's based out of state. So I have the unencumbered, you know, I'm able to say I don't owe anybody but my constituents anything. And I think that's a huge advantage, and I think there are going to be a lot of people like me in November going to Congress and saying, we're not doing it the way you've been doing it. We're going to start over. We're going to start fresh. And that group is going to be a powerful conglomerate that can actually get some stuff done. I actually think the inexperience is the best thing about me in some ways, because it means it's not, it's, it's not an experience. It's uh, fresh ideas. It's a new approach. It's an, you know, an ability to, to function outside of the old system that has been holding us back. Any other questions? Kendra, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. I want to thank uh, everyone for coming out. I want to thank you for if your parents. I want to thank my uh, co-chair, Dan Miller, Libby Durr had to hurry back. They actually have daytime jobs that they uh, have, to, have to work at. I very much appreciate the Government Affairs Committee and all the work they do. It's, uh, it's been a very busy election season. Wish you all the luck. The Harvard Town Area Chamber does not uh, endorse candidates but we make every effort in the world to get as much uh, uh, information out about the candidates so that our membership can uh, get, uh, get out there and uh, actively work together most, uh, both to make Montague County, our region, and our state uh, a better place to live, work, and play. So thank you again for coming. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you all.